Alles. It's time to educate, get to communicate. Yes, it's our health at stake. My friends, don't be blinded. Oh no. They're taking over the land. It's time we make our stand. It's time you know about companies like Monsanto. Oh no. Oh no. Polluting with chemical spray, poisoning waters day after day. Kamehameha school said they could stay because they pay. Awe. Awe. Now look at the long term effect when it's the land you neglect. The Ahupuwa has been a wreck and you're looking for your paycheck. Where's the respect? Where's the respect? Let's put our faith in the natural way. Forget the chemicals and your pesticide spray. Educate yourself for the children of today. Food grown organic and pure will always be the number one cure. You'll all be grateful when you say no to G. My name is Shandell Asuncion. I'm with GMO Free Hawaii Island, and our group focuses on taking action, education, and legislation to create a more sustainable future for the island of Hawaii. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is um, today is to really bring Hawaii's agricultural trends into the light. Um, today in Hawaii, 70% of our agricultural lands are productive agricultural lands are either leased or owned by seed and chemical companies. That's with only a little more than 10% of the food that we consume in Hawaii is actually grown here. Now with those statistics in mind, it's surprising to see the current trends and it's also surprising to see that we're still losing prime agricultural lands to housing developments. Um, so buy local, come say, buy local, Eat Local is a campaign that helps to build our local economy. Yet the seed and chemical companies pose a real threat to their neighbors, the environment, to our health, to our economy, and increasingly in our ability to create our own county and state laws. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to ask Dr. Melissa Yi to come forward and share some introductions for tonight's presenters with you. So please give Dr. Mosley a nice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. How are you this afternoon, evening? Thank you. Afternoon so far. Uh, we just flew in from Maui. We had a very successful tour there, um, and people are all revved up to start a new initiative. So I'm Dr. Melissa Yi. I'm a doctor of oriental medicine and acupuncture, and also a beekeeper. And uh, I'm the founder and coordinator of, Hawaii, uh, of Seeds of Truth, which has existed for about six years. And we actually got started when uh, I got together some people who are experts on GMO and started learning about GMO, GMO myself. And I realized this was something that was very important that more people had to learn about it. And so for the last six years, we've been focusing on educational panels and uh, health fairs, going out to the public, to schools and seniors and whoever would listen to us and talking to them about GMO. And in the course of the last six years, we've seen enormous changes occur, and I'm really, really happy to see that this movement is moving forward and in the direction, although right now locked up in, in court, uh, a greater awareness is encouraging people to start um, growing organic, eating organic, and really supporting a return to a sustainable agriculture as well as sustainable lifestyle. So this is very encouraging, and uh, all the people who are here today are, each one of you, empowered through your own uh, consciousness, through your own desire to go out and spread this information to others, because it's really important that we take on the uh, responsibility of doing something ourselves. But we have a really <laughs> big issue now with GMO, and you have managed to stay pretty much GMO-free, except for the papaya and corn. And I commend you for that because I wish it were so on the other islands. But again, because the counties are so strong, you're really making your voices heard. And Hawaii has become a, a center of attention for the whole world. 
uh, people are aware of what's happening here, and they're really holding their breath to see that Hawaii is successful in um, becoming strong as an organic center, uh, becoming independent in its food, food production and food supply, and really showing the rest of the world that we can eventually be leading it. And if the people get together and say, we're going to do it, then it'll happen. Because I really, truly feel that in the last six years, we've made it very clear that we don't want the lifestyle, we don't want the government that we've been seeing, and the changes are in motion right now. So thank you all. So again, Shaka Movement, Hawaii Seeds, Center for Food Safety, uh, GMO Free Hawaii Island, all of you have contributed to making this uh, tour and this event happen. Um, we're all working together. All these different groups are coming together on this very important issue. So I'm really, really happy to see how we can collaborate and come to great results. So let's start with our first speaker, Dr. Judy Carmen. Um, she has so graciously accepted to come to Hawaii from Australia. I met her actually through the GMO Judy Carmen website, and I was really happy to get a response from her, from her that she wanted to come to Hawaii to speak. And she's really bringing her humor and her uh, very deep scientific knowledge to us and got a great response on Maui, and I really welcome her to share her knowledge with you today. Thank you. So first of all, thank you all very much for having me here. Thank you all to all those people who assisted me in coming to your beautiful islands. Um, it's a great honour to be here. I'll first of all start off with my qualifications. First of all, can people hear me in the yes. back? Yes. People can hear me back? Excellent. Um, and hopefully the accent won't get you too confused. Um, so I'll just describe the qualifications that I have because they become fairly relevant to the talk that I give. So I've got a, a Bachelor of Science in uh, Biochemistry and Organic Chemistry. I've got an Honours Degree in Organic Chemistry. Now, an Honours Degree is like a mini Masters in Australia. Then I've got a PhD in Medicine in the field of Metabolic Regulation and Nutritional Biochemistry. Then I've got a Master of Public Health. Um, so I'm specialising there in Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So I've got the, and that's a, a member of a particular um, professional organisation. Um, so, um, with all of this background, um, I've also worked in HIV AIDS and nutrition. I've worked in a government research uh, uh, organisation for nutrition. I've also uh, worked as a senior epidemiologist in my state government investigating outbreaks of disease. So I've got food from both the nutritional side and also from the disease that can make you sick side, how do you investigate it. So I've got experience from uh, chemistry to isolated cells to tissue culture to animal studies to human studies. Um, so I've got that whole background. And I'm also on the uh, technical expert uh, group of um, uh, a United Nations committee um, trying to bring uh, um, uh, resources to governments uh, to be able to safety assess genetically modified organisms. So hopefully I know what I'm talking about. Um, right, so we'll start with how GM crops are made. So they're made in a variety of ways, but particularly, the main problem with them is that you might be inserting this new gene randomly. One of the ways they insert the gene is what's called the biolistics method. So they get tiny gold or tungsten balls coated with the DNA they want to insert into the crop, and then they literally use a modified shotgun to shoot it at a monolayer of tissue and to hope that some of it will stick inside the DNA of that plant and won't cause too much damage to the plant so that it will actually function in the way that they want it to. So you can see it's a bit of a hit and miss affair. Now there are other ways of actually inserting DNA but all of them have the same problem and that is that it might go somewhere in the GMO genome of the plant that might affect the natural functioning of the plant to have the plant make more of something, make less of something else and there's a possibility that the plant might produce something new that has not been made before. Um, they insert all sorts of things into them. It's usually done as what's called a gene cassette, where there are a number of these sorts of bits of DNA from these sorts of organisms that go into the cassette, which is then put into the plant. 
One of the main problems is a lot of the uh, old, older ones, including those you're eating today, have what's called co um, a promoter sequence from cauliflower mosaic virus. There's a problem with that. It might be a particular recombinant hotspot. So that you put the gene in there, and oops, out a bit of it comes and goes over there. So it might uh, actually have some longer term uh, uh, problems in the plant. They also tend to put in antibiotic resistant marker genes. And I've seen one potato that had resistance to five antibiotics put into it at the same time. So we hear stories about how genetically modified food is going to feed the world and it's going to be drought resistant and it's going to have all sorts of marvellous things with it. Most of them to date have been uh, made to be resistant to a herbicide, particularly glyphosate, which sold as Roundup. The aim here being that you genetically modify the plant so that it's resistant to a herbicide so that when the plant is growing in a field, you can spray the crop the plant will live and the weeds around it will die. Now, therefore, and uh, uh, Stephanie Senef will talk more about this, uh, there's a considerable uh, chance that you'll end up with more of the herbicide in the food when you eat it. The other type makes its own pesticides so that now you don't have to spray a particular pesticide on the plant because every cell of the plant's making it. So if you were pre previously able to wash some of the excess um, uh, pesticide off, say, your broccoli when you got home. Now you can't because it's in every cell of the plant. Now, there are stacked crops being made that have both of these in there at the same time. And uh, multi-stacked, we now have up to eight of these genes stacked into a plant. Basically, they'll put you know one of these genes into, say, a variety of corn, another gene into a variety of corn, another gene into a variety of corn, then they'll cross them over using natural plant breeding and they'll get a multi-stacked plant. And so, as I said, we've got an eight stack currently uh, being grown in the United States. Well, they tried to, didn't yield very well actually, so whether it's still being grown is an interesting question. So let's talk about the gold, because I'm talking about safety assessments here on crops. So let's look at the gold standard of safety assessments. And that is the uh, clinical trial as uh, is used on a new pharmaceutical uh, drug that comes into the human drug supply, okay? This is what they should be doing, this is what they usually do. The first thing, before they go anywhere near people, is they test it on animals, right? They test it to see if it works, and they test it to see what the adverse effects are. If it passes that step, it then goes into, starts the four phases of a clinical trial where phase one in people is to get a small number of healthy people and see if it causes them harm. If it passes that stage, then it goes into the next one where small numbers of people does the new drug do what they hope it will do. And then if it passes that stage, they go into larger numbers of people, a thing called a randomized controlled trial where they get a whole pile of people on the new drug, a whole pile of people either on a sugar pill or the existing treatment, and they compare them to see if what benefit there is and what side effects there are. If it passes that stage and it goes into the pharmaceutical supply, then it is generally monitored in the community. And now there's an extra stage whereby they will get a lot of these different trials, join them together into a meta-analysis of the results. Gold standard. Where do you think GM crops are in this gold standard? Try no human testing. All right, all of this, hasn't been done for GM crops. So we're left with animal testing. So how good has that been done? Let's have a look. Now, how do we know what sort of animal tests have been done? Well, one of the best ways is for me to go to my food regulator, which is called Fazance. It's the food regulator for Australia and New Zealand put together, and to actually see what they do. So I looked at 12 reports that they wrote on foods that they assessed to be safe, covering 28 GM crops. And I did this to determine several things. What do they need from the company? What does the company give to them? And how does all of that compare to the gold standard? So let's have a look. Right, there are four main things you should test for, really, I think. One of those is allergies. Is it going to cause you to have an allergic reaction? Cancer, reproduction, you know, does it harm your ability to have children? 
and what do the children look like? <laughs> and then there's toxicity. Now the allergies, there's been some work done on that and I can go into this but I'm on limited time. I can do this later if you want to ask me a question. But it's largely theoretically. It's not actually tested on animals and it's not actually tested on people. Not done, not, not fed for animals long enough for any cancers to develop. Zero of this. There's some done on toxicity. And basically the testing that's done is basically based on toxicity. And what I'm going to do now is just describe the toxicity testing. Now, they don't need any toxicity testing, right? The only thing they need is a thing called substantial equivalence or compositional comparison. So what they do here, they get some samples of the GM crop, they get some samples of the non-GM crop, and they compare them in their ash, the nutrient, the amount of protein in them, that kind of really basic test. <coughs> they might take the protein and break them down into the amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, and they might compare those. Sometimes they might look at anti-nutrients, that kind of thing. So there's not much done there. Now you need to keep in mind that if this sort of process of genetic engineering might cause a problem in people, it probably because there's been a new protein that's been produced, which could <coughs> cause an allergy or whatever. I can't hear you, sorry. Sorry. Well, there could be a new protein produced, which might cause an allergy or something like that. Now if you break down the proteins into the building blocks, you've lost all that information. It's a bit like comparing the safety, fire safety of this building compared to the one next door, not by looking at the exits or the escape plans or anything, but by knocking it down and counting the bricks. All right? You've just lost all the information you need. So that's what this is really like when you compare the amino acids. The other thing is that we've got really small sample sizes. Now, with small sample sizes, you're trying to find a difference using that it becomes very hard to find statistically significant differences. We're doing statistics on these numbers. You need to find a statistically significant difference. Not just a difference, statistically significantly. And you can't find that if the numbers are low. Right? So even clinically important stuff, you can't find if there are low numbers. And when uh, these guys report their information, it is not sufficient for a, uh, a journal not sufficient for a scientist to be able to read, to see what they've done and what they've found. Now this is a classic thing, you know, if you're going to, when do you know if you're breaking the speed limit? Because someone's told you what the speed limit is. If there's no speed limit, how can you break the speed limit? There's no definition for substantial equivalence. So how can anything not be substantially equivalent? Right? So here we have, we've got one corn here, which is in the Amer it's grown in America, it's in the American food supply, where almost half of the amino acids were statistically significantly different even on really small sample sizes, hey, guess what? It's substantially equivalent. Right, what do they not require? They don't require any animal studies, any human studies, and uh, the company may give them raw data, but they have a policy of not reviewing the raw data. So that actually means that they are relying upon, upon what the company says is in the raw data. They're not checking it. Okay. Now, if you've got these stacked crops, nothing, nothing's required for them. Because you see, if you've got a corn variety with that GM gene in it, and another corn variety with that GM gene in it, and another corn variety with that gene in it, you can cross them in any way you want, and you have, don't even do, need to do substantial equivalence. Because if it's been approved, if the gene's been approved in that type of crop, you can have it stacked as many times as you want. So that's how my field authority does it. Now, keep in mind that three quarters of your US corn was stacked uh, with both. What both is an HT gene. gene? That's, sorry, that's um, herbicide tolerance, okay. and that's that insecticidal okay. protein. Okay. Right. Now, let's talk about the toxicity testing. Now, of these plants that I reviewed, these GM crops that I reviewed, two-thirds of them, this was the only animal testing done, okay? Now, what they did, said was, okay, we've genetically engineered this plant to do, make this protein. We're going to get that protein, just that protein, we're going to feed it down the throats of some rats as one dose, and we're going to see if they die within the next 7 to 14 days. All right. If it passes that test, it's fine. So what are the problems here? Well, first of all, 
They're assuming that the uh, that crop is only going to produce that new protein. Nothing else is going to happen. Okay? Have they checked really, really thoroughly that that's the case? The other thing is to uh, white. So the protein that they're putting down the throats of the rats doesn't actually come from the plant. They genetically engineer bacteria to produce what they hope is the same protein. They put that down the throats of the rats. Mm -hmm. So plants are more complex. They can do things to proteins after they're made that bacteria can't. So it may not be the same protein that they're feeding to the rats. And the other big ask, of course, is that if it's going to harm you, it will do so within 14 days, won't it? Yeah. Right, so that's, as I said, two-thirds of them, that's the only one that had been done by the industry, given to the regulator before the regulator, my regulator, said it was safe to eat. Now, the industry does sometimes also provide animal feeding studies to regulators to say, look how safe it is. Now, a couple of important things here. First of all, the crop that's fed to animals, if it's a herbicide tolerant crop like Roundup Ready Soy, is generally not sprayed first. So you'll be eating it sprayed. They fed it to the animals, unsprayed. Now, they have what I would regard as unusual health models. So if you're going to feed it, they use standard health models to feed it to rats, yeah? People know that, the standard lab rat. What they use here, quite often is things like chickens, cows, trout. Now, are you a chicken? Let me see. Do you have feathers? Do you uh, lay eggs? Uh, do you have two stomachs? Do you swallow grit to help grind your food? Do, you, do your kidneys actually produce urine? Because chickens are different, right? They do all these things. Their kidneys don't even produce urine. If you're a cow, you produce milk, right? Do you eat grass? Are you physiologically similar to a fish, to a chicken? And yet these are the sorts of studies that they're using. So they're basically using farm animals, and the measurements they take on these farm animals are farm measurements. Does the animal die? Does it put on weight? The more weight, the better, because, gee, that's really good in, in human society. <laughs> and they might measure things on chickens like breast meat, because that's really important for your health. Men, I'm sorry, you must fail. Um, and also things like abdominal fat pad, that's really good. Um, and um, milk production. So once again, men, if you start producing milk, you must be really healthy. So these are, they're not really relevant to human health, are they? What they really are, are experiments to reassure farmers that if they feed their animals these crops, their animals will get big enough, heavy enough, have enough breast meat to get enough a good price of life. They're actually animal production studies, they're not human health studies. Sometimes they actually do a, a toxicology study, but these are not common. So I'll talk about these now. So this is like the best they do, okay? This is the best standard that the industry will do in giving information to a food regulator to say it's safe. As I said, they're not common. The first thing is that you know, these days, sometimes the industry will actually feed it to rats. So we're talking about rats now because they're the standard animal model for measuring toxicity on something, of something. Um, sometimes now they actually feed it to rats for three months, but that's 90 days, but that's actually still not long enough for cancers to develop. But all the ones that I looked at, it was only one month maximum, which is clearly not long enough. For cancers to develop. So they're not long enough for adverse effects to develop. Number of animals are too low. So if you've got 10 rats in a group or 20 rats in a group, then a quarter of the rats have got to die and none in, in one group and none in the other before you reach statistical significance. All right? So if 20% of the rats die, that's fine, you can eat it. If you've got 10 rats in a group, half have got to die before you reach statistical significance. So. The number of rats are too low. The measurements taken are often woefully inadequate for human health. Once again, <coughs> often only body weights and death rates. So if they live, they must be healthy. So how many people do you know who are alive and who are not healthy? They've got cancer, they've got diabetes, they've got heart disease, but according to this, they are healthy, okay? The other thing is that if they do uh, look inside the animal, they might actually weigh some organs 
But unless you look inside the organ, you don't know if it's diseased. Because diseased organs might weigh the same as healthy organs. Mm. So you really need to open up the organ and have a look. Blood biochemistry, this is a standard sort of test that you might take if you go to a doctor. Um, none in all of these studies that I looked at. In some of the three month studies, yes, they can do that. And if they find adverse findings, and they do, they're not investigated further. They're explained away. Now, on the basis of these sorts of tests, you would expect that tobacco would be healthy to asbestos, <laughs> alcohol, thalidomide, right? No reproductive studies, so thalidomide would pass. Right. I've published this in a uh, chapter in a University of New South Wales press book, a book published by a university. Right, so you've got a better system. You're America, haven't you? You've got a better system than this. Right, so you have no requirements. <laughs> Remember I said that uh, my government had certain requirements that companies had to fulfil as minimal as they are. Well, you have none. You have a completely voluntary system. My, my government has a compulsory system. You have a completely voluntary system. So that means that if a company in, wants to bring uh, GM food for Americans to eat into the human food supply in America, they don't have to supply anything to the FDA. Now, in reality, they do. They provide information voluntarily. But then, of course, the FDA would do a proper thorough safety assessment and say, yes, it's safe, wouldn't they? <laughs> yes. Well, no, they don't. So basically, um, what they say, and I'm paraphrasing here, I can give the exact words, but essentially what they say is, thank you, GM company, for giving me this information. I have no more questions. We understand that you, the company, say it's safe to eat. We don't. We say, we understand you say, and if it isn't, well, then you must take the consequences. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, that probably leads them wide open for um, legal action if they're not, if they're found to be unsafe. Right, so I talked about those sorts of feeding studies. And these are the ones that uh, the government regulators look at. Now, once again, we've published this in a very high-end journal, Environment International. Where I'll talk about the pig study, pig toxicology study that we did, but we got hassled for that because we didn't do histopathology studies on it. Um, so what we did is we did a review on crops with three common GM genes. So this is uh, the Roundup Ready gene and two of those BT genes. We had a look to see what had been published. Now we're looking at... Um, <clears throat> these are studies you look at under a microscope. You take tissues out of the animal, you look at them under a microscope to see what you can see. This gives the clearest indication of any toxicity. When we did this study, we looked at rats because that's what you're supposed to do um, histopathology studies on, ideally. And anything less than 90 days duration was not looked at because it's not long enough to find anything. Um, and the OECD standard animal for doing this on is the rat, which is why they looked at it. We looked in the digestive tract because that's your first site of contact and that's where it is for the longest time. We, and now we found 47 crop varieties had been approved somewhere in the world containing one or two or three of these genes. So we're looking at stack genes as well. And we found that there were no published studies for 81% of them. Not a single study had been published. Only 19% had anything <coughs> published against them. And we found that of that 19%, three quarters of the studies were published after they'd been approved as safe. So in other words, the studies not being, the crops are not being assessed as safe based on these sorts of studies. And half of them at least nine years after you've been eating them. Uh, interestingly enough, we found that not a single study had been uh, properly conducted. So things such as, they weren't clear about what they were doing. They would say, oh look, we're going to look at three organs, and then they only report the results for one. Or they uh, say, we didn't find anything toxic here, but they don't tell you what they find toxic. There's no definition of toxic. Um, or they saw changes and they just dismissed them without any real reason. So really, we concluded that there was a lack of evidence that the crops are safe to eat. Now, before I go into the pig study, I just want to highlight a new type of crop uh, that is coming on board now, uh, in particular now. Now remember I said that GM crops are the ones, the traditional ones, are ones where you change the DNA with the aim of producing a new protein. These are different. 
The aim here is to change the DNA so that you get a <coughs> piece of what's called RNA. And that goes back onto the gene and either silences a gene or it activates a gene. Now there are two main types that this is being used now. In plants, for example, this is my government research organisation. They're playing with wheat and barley to change the type of starch. So they're silencing a gene so that the type of starch that's in the wheat and the barley is different, so that it, um, it survives digestion for longer and it's supposed to give you a health benefit, therefore. The other main kind is where you change the DNA of the plant so it produces one of these pieces of RNA, then when the grub comes along and eats it, the grub eats the plant, eats the RNA, the RNA is designed to survive digestion, so it survives digestion, and it goes into the tissues of the body of the grub and it kills the grub. It silences a gene in the grub. Now, we, this is published, this is all published work and this is also you know, patents and so forth that are out there. The other type is actually where you get this double-stranded RNA and you spray it directly on the crop, like a, a, an insecticide. And then you've got problems with spray drift and getting into the waterways, haven't you? Because it's, um, it's quite long-lived in the environment. Now we also know, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, that, there are, that plants normally make double-stranded RNA and that, on some of these, where they're not designed to survive digestion, uh, they can, and they can actually um, get into the blood of people. Right. Now, some of these we know also that they can change, change gene expression in mice and also human cells in tissue culture. Now, it's early days yet with this technology, so we don't have an awful lot of experimental work to work out exactly what they can do, but they're already in the plants. All right, they're already genetically modifying plants to be able to do this sort of thing. So you'd think that it would be a good idea to have some good regulation around this, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Guess what? We did a review, and it's published once again in a very high-end journal, where we looked at three different government regulators in three different countries to see how are they regulating these sorts of crops. And we found that they just didn't consider it as a possibility, that there might be some problem. And if they did, they just assumed that it was safe. And what we found, in fact, with the CSIRO wheat, this wheat variety that's designed to survive digestion yet further into the bowel, that they were actually planning some animal studies and they were planning some human studies, but they weren't going to do any animal studies before they fed it to people. And when they did, they weren't going to look for harm. All right? Remember, it's supposed to have a benefit for the people. It's supposed to survive digestion, improve the health of their bowel. They were only going to feed it to people and look for that. They weren't going to look for any harm. They weren't going to see if it harmed the liver or the kidneys or, or anything else. Mm. And there's a particular problem with this wheat because the gene that's silenced in the plant, you happen to have a similar gene in you. Mm. And remember, this stuff can survive digestion and get into the tissues of the body, so there's a risk that it might do that in you and get into you and get into your liver. And some people are, have a very silenced gene this gene very science because they're born without that gene and those people tend to die by the age of five years of age. So it's a pretty good idea to do some safety assessments on it, don't you think? And they haven't. They have no intention of looking. Right, so what happens when you exceed these uh, rather uh, high standards? <laughs> See, it's probably not terribly hard. We looked in pigs, so what we did, I'll just go back. This has been published, once again, um, and this was done, Howard Lieber was very important in this whole study. Uh, we've got people between Australia and uh, the United States. This was a pig study done on, uh, on as I said, on pigs, um, in the United States. So it's long term, right, proper long term this time, and this is a combined diet, stacked genes. Uh, and we've got a GM soy and a GM maize diet um, fed at the same time on pigs. So why pigs? They have a digestive system rather similar to people. So we've got physiologically similar animals to people, uh, particularly the digestive system. And the other reason for looking in pigs was that the thing about farm animals in the United States is that they've been eating these for a long period of time, longer really than you have, and in high concentrations too. 
So a standard pig diet is GM soy and GM maize corn, and that's basically it. All right. So they're having it in high concentrations for their entire lifespan and now several generations. We're seeing problems in pigs. We're seeing reproductive problems and digestive problems in pigs. Particularly the reproductive in sows, which are the female pigs, we're seeing a reduced ability to conceive and higher rates of miscarriage. And in the males, in the boars, that's an interesting thing about that because now most farmers use artificial insemination where you get a straw of a certain guaranteed number of viable sperm and the genetics of the pigs they take the sperm from are much higher now than they were before. So during the introduction of GM crops, we've also had this introduction of better genetics, uh, which may be masking some of the things that we're seeing in pigs, uh, therefore, because there are some uh, religious organisations in the United States that are, uh, they don't allow artificial insemination. So for them, the boars service the sows, and in those, they're also finding um, a reduction in the number of piglets born. So there may actually be uh, problems in male reproductive health and in female reproductive health in pigs. Mm. The other thing he was saying is that we're seeing a lot of digestive problems in them. We're seeing a lot of inflammation in the stomach, in the small intestine, and some of these pigs can literally go down in a screaming heap but the, uh, some part of the wall of the intestine can get so thin that it ruptures and they bleed out and scream and, and die within about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And they obviously... Yeah, they, is um, that just particular GM crop? No, this is what some farmers are seeing in their herds. So in some many different crops that they're being fed or just the soy? Well, we d well, this is an observation seen by farmers and they often don't know which particular GM crops they're feeding to their animals. Okay, but what Howard's been saying is that um, the problems go away when you feed non-GM feed to the animals, and they come back when they go back onto GM feed. So we had some really good hypotheses to test here in, in an experiment, and that is to feed them to pigs for long enough for things to happen. But look at things in, you know, reproductive organs and to look in the digestive tract. So that's what we did. We got, this is a commercial piggery, right? It's being seen in commercial piggeries, so we chose a commercial piggery, um, hog farm, you call it, hog farm, commercial hog farm. We got standard pigs for that, we got them just weaned. So they were, for their entire commercial lifespan, they were on either the GM diet or the non-GM diet. So what you do is you what's called randomise them. You get a whole pile of pigs and you randomise them into one of two groups, GM fed, non-GM fed. So at the start of the experiment, they're exactly the same. You've got the same number of boys, the same number of girls in each of the groups. You house them the same way. You feed them the same way. Everything's kept the same. So at the end of the experiment, if there's a difference, it must be due to the diet. And the diet, we've got either GM corn and soy or non-GM corn and soy. And soy and corn diet is standard in pigs in the US. Now the boys are neutered at three days of age in order to try and prevent boar taint coming into the meat. So we can't look at the reproductive uh, organs of males, unfortunately. Uh, fed for the t uh, commercial lifespan, equal numbers, and they were individually followed and they were monitored daily for quite a lot of different things. So pigs, they're arriving, this is how small they are when they arrive into the piggery in an old school bus. They've been randomised and they've been put into pens at that stage. And this is when they're bigger. I mean, they get big, pigs get big. And these are in what's called the growing and finishing phase of the piggery. So they had to go to another piggery for that, another site. So, mixed soy and corn, normal for US piggeries. Mm -hmm. We've got three GM genes being fed at once, common in the USA. Half were fed the non-GM crop grown from the same area, and apparently substantially equivalent according to government regulators. Uh, we couldn't get an isogenic crop. That gets into more detailed stuff, but... Um, we also made sure that they were processed on the same equipment, so we've got the same grind size, we've got ground for the same period of time, you know, there's really nothing that could be regarded as different between them. We measured mycotoxins between the feeds, so we know that there's no 
any difference we see due to the GM diet is not due to mycotoxins in the diet. After their commercial lifespan, they went to an abattoir slaughterhouse, I think you call it, where they went into the food supply, we got their internal organs, and we uh, went and weighed the organs, and we cut open and inspected certain organs. It was done by veterinarians, people trained in the area, and they were blinded. So they didn't know which pig was fed GM or which pig was fed non-GM, so they couldn't interfere in the process. Okay? They couldn't go, oh, this is a GM fed pig, I think I'll just increase the rating of something rather than that. They couldn't do it. So this is inside the abattoir. My apologies to all the, veterani uh, to all the vegetarians in here. Um, and these are the entrails from the pigs. And that's what we're looking at here. We're also getting the kidneys out later on. We're having a look. Sliced certain organs and had a look. That's inside a kidney. That's inside the lungs. So they're big. You can see big organs. And he's slicing through and having a look inside to see if there's any, for example, pneumonia showing up. They're the entrails. You can see there's a lot there, so we couldn't actually uh, have a look inside the intestine, the large or small intestines, because they're just too big and they're too full of food, too full of digester. So we could only look inside the stomach, and that's what we did. But we did weigh the organs, remember? And remember there was that question mark about whether it would cause uh, a problem in reproductive health. 25% higher, greater weight of the uterus, in the pigs fed GM feed. Highly statistically significant. So all these results are statistically significant results that I'm going to give you. If something was higher or lower but not statistically different, I'm not giving it to you. Okay. Once again, we can't look inside the mouths. We don't know what's happening with them. But um, higher uterus weight. Now this could be due to quite a few different issues, health issues, all of which have long names, all of which you don't want to have. But I can give them to you if you're interested. Now, stomach inflammation. Remember, we could look inside the stomachs, and we did. Um, we measured it. The veterinarians measured it as nil, mild, moderate, and severe. Um, and they did that on the basis of an earlier experiment where they got some pig stomachs. They opened them up, and they went, yes, that, that, we rate that as that, and that as that. So here's the veterinarian looking at a pig stomach. And he, you see these folds here? He's turning those over to look around the other side of them, both sides of them. He's counting all of the ulcers. He's counting the type of ulcers, the size of the ulcers, as, and he's grating, uh, grading the type of inflammation in them. And that's the inflammation there on the side. So this is a standard not inflamed stomach. You can see it's this sort of beige colour on either side. So with this stomach, you've got the feeding tube, the esophagus coming up here, and the stomach's like this. We've cut it around greatest and opened it like that. So you can see that we it's actually a light beige colour. So this is mild inflammation. You can see there's a bit of red starting up. Moderate <coughs> inflammation, more red. And that is severe. Now, I'm sure you would join with me in saying that you wouldn't want a stomach like that. I wouldn't. Uh, and for it to be rated as severe, almost the entire fundus had to be cherry red, bright red in colour. Okay. So what we found was that with the type of diet that pigs get fed in the United States, it's finely ground. It causes a little bit of irritation in the stomach. But if you feed them GM feed, it takes that low level of inflammation and bumps it right up to severe. So if you look at the severe difference in severe inflammation and compare them between the GM and the non-GM fed, overall it was two and a half times greater chance of getting that severe inflammation if you were fed the GM diet. In females, just over twice as high, but in males, four times more likely to get that severe inflammation. So what could be causing this? Well, the major contenders, as far as I can see, are likely to be the fact that there are two of these BT proteins. How, are they, how do they work inside the grub? Well, when the grub eats them, they, they're designed to rupture the gut of the grub. So perhaps they're doing something rather similar here. And maybe it might be the fact that you know, one BT protein may not cause too much damage, but two together, maybe they work synergistically. Maybe they're working together. Um, 
to cause this sort of inflammation. A grub is an insect. Grub is an insect, yes. So, blood biochemistry. So we've got, um, blood was taken from these pigs two days before they were autopsied and we couldn't see any difference in the blood biochemistry between the GM and the non-GM. So the biochemistry is the same sort of, you go to your doctor and get a blood test, takes it to the lab, comes back with quite a few readings, that's what we're talking about here. It's a measure of health. But importantly here was that the standard biochemistry they're using did not pick up the results. It didn't pick up the stomach inflammation. It didn't pick up the uterus results because the standard biochemistry doesn't actually have inflammatory markers in it. It doesn't measure inflammation. It also doesn't measure things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And yet when the companies do, if they, if they do biochemistry, they do the standard biochemistry. In other words, their tests aren't good enough to pick up these sorts of things on blood. So, in conclusion to that, if you do a properly controlled study where you're feeding animals physiologically similar to humans, they're fed for a long time, in this case over five months, since they were babies, since they were weaned, they get the same nutrients and care, the care complied with industry standards, and all those involved were blinded and, you know, didn't know which pigs were fed. GM and which were fed non-GM, you know, that is all the people doing the slaughtering, all the people doing the feeding, all the people doing the, the you know, the weighing and the, the autopsies, um, you can find a difference. And we did. Now, and it caused some inflammation neutrine pathologies. We have a similar digestive tract. That was one of the reasons we picked pigs. And in my view, all GM crops should undergo long-term <coughs> safety testing on animals that are physiologically comparable to humans by independent researchers before a GM crop is commercialised, including those containing stacked genes. And they really should have those four major tests done on them. Allergies, reproductive health, um, toxicity, and feed them for long enough for cancers to develop. So if you want more information, please go to that site. Uh, that is a fan site. I don't actually run it. But they're very good at putting up pictures of pig stomachs and copies of uh, journal articles and um, any sort of attacks that we get from the industry or people associated with them. All the rebuttals are up on that website, so please go there. And I just want to finish with labelling. Um, we've got labelling in Australia. When we got it, the sky did not fall in. <laughs> New Zealand's got labelling. 64 countries in the world have got some sort of, you know, requirement for labelling. Um, America can't do it. <laughs> So America comes to other countries in the world and, and lectures us all on democratic rights and then doesn't give its own citizens one of the most basic ones, I would have thought. Um, and in any country that it was that brought in labelling, um, the price of food did not go up. Okay? And uh, the European Union, which covers 19 countries, um, actually said this. Uh, so this is the EU Commissioner for Health and Consumer Protection said. When the labelling regime was introduced in 1997, 18 years ago, they've had it for 18 years, longer than you have, um, it did not result in an increase in costs, despite the horrifying double-digit digit prediction of some interests. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so who, that's who labels. Why label? Well, I do believe you do have a right to know what's in your food so you can choose. But the other main reason is for epidemiological studies. So I'm an epidemiologist. <coughs> if I ever want to investigate whether uh, the exposure, the eating of GM crops is causing a certain harm in people, I need to come to people and I need to ask them, what have you been eating? So if I'm trying to find a link between a particular GM crop and a particular health outcome, I need to come to you and say, well, what have you been eating? Have you been eating this particular type of corn? You can't tell me because it's not on the label. I could go to the food manufacturer and ask, how do they know? They're not required to know. And so therefore, really, the first step of an epidemiological study into the health effects of a particular GM crop can't be done, not in America. And that's another reason why you really need to know is for future epidemiological studies. So with that, I will thank you very much for listening to me.
Let's put our faith in the natural way Forget your chemicals and your pesticide spray Educate yourself for the children of today Cause food grown organic and pure will always be the number one cure You'll all be grateful when you say no to GMO Gotta say no to GMO Tell you what it stands for Genetically modified organisms My friend, I don't want to be known Genetically modified organisms